Hello, thanks for being in a new video. This time I have full review of the Motorola Edge 50 Pro. Let's get started. Without a doubt, this is one of the best options to buy right now. In fact, I could end my video here and tell you that it will be very difficult to find a better device than this in this price range. In Mexico, it was launched at 12,999 pesos at the Motorola store where they include the Moto Buds Plus. That's approximately $770. At least here in Mexico, the price looks very competitive. And what surprises me the most is that even on Telcel, it's going to be cheaper at 10,999 pesos, which is approximately $650, although they don't include the Moto Buds Plus. So, in any of the options, the price is super competitive whether you want the headphones or not. But usually in Telcel, the prices are very, very high, and that's why I'm surprised that with this distributor, which is the largest phone company in Mexico, it's also a very competitive price. In fact, if you look at its competitors, it really is a very important competition, considering that this one has 512 gigabytes of storage and very good features as well, which we will know below. But being a Motorola, it has very good distribution as well, so it's not that hard to get it. So that can be a strong point as well, but join me in getting to know the design. Aesthetically, it is a device that looks very nice due to the small bezels it has and even also due to the curved screen. So both at the top and bottom we find very thin bezels and thanks to the curved screen the side bezels are also very thin. So in this sense we do find a very premium look. But it is not only an aesthetically very nice device, but also has a certain level of resistance. In this case it is Gorilla Glass 5, a level that I think is in accordance with its price. Although I must tell you that yes, there are a few devices that will even offer us Gorilla Glass Victus in this price range, but they really are few. I think it is a device that does offer good resistance and good design. On the right side we find the power button along with the volume buttons that are completely separated in a very thin aluminum frame. At the top we find a microphone and we also have two plastic bands to help the connectivity of the antennas, since this frame is completely metallic. The left side confirms that it is a relatively thin device, being 8.19 millimeters thick, and at the bottom we find the slot where we can place the nano SIM card. In fact, there are regions where the second slot is unlocked, but in Mexico it probably comes locked. This should be confirmed at the place of purchase because it may vary. We will also find here the microphone, then the USB-C port and the main speaker. The back cover is one of the nicest you're going to find these days. In fact, it's funny because there are two versions. This version has a pearlescent acetate back cover, that's what Motorola has decided to call it. And specifically this version called Marble White, they claim it's a handmade cover made in Italy and honestly it does look very nicely detailed, it even has a really very nice soft feel to it. There are other versions made with synthetic leather, specifically the Eclipse Black and Lavender Purple versions, so whichever version you get, the design really is very nice. And also in this sense it gives us good resistance because it is less likely to break if it is accidentally dropped. And to confirm that it has good resistance, it offers us the IP68 level of water resistance, so it can be submerged. Remember that this level is obtained with pure water, so if you get to immerse this device in salt water or pool water, do it for short periods of time at a shallow depth and remember to rinse it well with pure water to ensure proper operation in the future. But there is no doubt that we are in front of a very well designed device, which has a weight of 186 grams, so that it is also very comfortable in the hand, as it also has this curved back cover. The screen is another very good element in this device. Its size is 6.7 inches in its diagonal with a slightly higher resolution than Full HD. It is specifically 1220 by 2712 pixels, which gives us a density in total of 446 pixels per inch. So it will be able to give us an excellent level of detail on this screen for multimedia content or for text. Also having an OLED technology, it gives us intense colors, very high contrasts and very good viewing angles. Motorola calls this type of flexible screen P-OLED as it reminds us that the curvature is present. In fact, its maximum peak brightness is 2000 nits when you are playing HDR content, so there are some areas of the screen that can project more brightness to give much more realism to the content you are viewing. It is of excellent quality and it is even a screen that has been validated by Pantone in terms of the interpretation of colors that it makes and also the interpretation of colors that it makes of the skin. So it's an excellent display by any standard. 
But not only does it have a very high brightness level, but also the lowest brightness level is going to be relatively comfortable for nighttime use. You can even enable dimming in the accessibility options to make nighttime viewing even more comfortable. It also has three different color calibration modes depending on the type of color you want to display. Whether you want these colors to be much more intense or more natural, and you can customize the screen temperature specifically thanks to this color wheel. The display also achieves a very high refresh rate of 144 Hz, which is actually very rare in the price range. Most displays go up to 120, but this one can go up to 144 and it can intelligently adapt itself so that it doesn't consume so much battery. So when you are viewing static content, it will go down to 60 Hz, and when there are transitions, it can go up to 144. Another important point is that it has a touch sampling rate of 360 Hz which can help you have a good response when playing games. Although it's not a specialist in that but it's gonna give you a good quality anyway. So it's an excellent screen. The sound will be very good as it integrates a speaker at the bottom and another speaker in the earpiece area for calls, so it does have stereo sound and it's also good quality considering the price. It may not be as powerful in terms of volume, but the quality is there. Let's listen to a little test. Although, remember it's not the same as listening to it live. Maybe. doesn't have as strong bass frequencies as high-end devices, but it's still a good quality sound. And with respect to the sound-focused software, note that it has Dolby Atmos and a feature called Smart Audio, so it's automatically going to try to adjust the sound for you to enjoy a good experience. However, you can also go into the settings to specifically select the music preset or in the custom setting you have access to a 10 band equalizer where you can specifically select how you want this device to sound. So if you like us so you can enjoy a very good sound experience in conjunction with all these Dolby Atmos settings. And as you already noticed, it doesn't come with a headphone jack. So if you want to use wired headphones, you'll have to use the USB-C port. But if you are going to use wireless headphones, there is good news because if you have headphones that have support for the LHDC codec version 3 or 4, you will be able to enjoy excellent audio resolution even without cable. Or you also have the APTX and APTX adaptive codec to have another good resolution audio with compatible headphones. So in this sense, the headphone experience will also be good. The device interestingly has three microphones, although only the one on the top and the one on the bottom are used to record voice or audio. The microphone on the side is focused solely on noise cancellation, which I'll tell you more about later. Below you will hear an audio test recorded with this device. Esta es una grabación hecha con los micrófonos integrados del Motorola Edge 50 Pro. For voice recording, the truth is that it has a very good quality, but below you will see a video recorded with this device in a very high volume environment, setting the sound system in my house at maximum volume to see how these conditions behave. Yes. As you notice, the microphones have noise cancellation that could spoil a little bit the music recording because it wants to reduce the noise of the music and leave only the voice in some scenarios. So I didn't like that aspect. Hopefully in an update they will allow us to enable or disable noise cancellation completely to our liking since for now it comes enabled and you can't disable it. The front camera is 50 megapixels, with f1.9 aperture and autofocus. Honestly, they are very advanced specifications to talk about the front camera. Generally, we see lower resolution sensors, we also see lower aperture, and we see fixed focus. So, in each parameter, it stands out a lot in its range. Remember that you have the gesture of turning the phone twice to enter the camera, or you could also double press the power button. 
So you can perfectly enter the camera not only when the device is locked but also when you are inside any other application and you want to quickly switch to the camera. So this kind of gestures give a very good user experience. The front camera offers us two levels of amplitude and the photo capture is not so agile. In this sense we do find a little weakness especially if you are backlit you will notice that the picture gets a little slower. Also although it does support a burst on the front camera it is not that fast but it could be good enough to make a photo photo session with your friends making multiple faces and then choose which one is your favorite. In the bottom right corner we will find the button for the beauty options which as you will notice have a lot of parameters. First the skin beautification, you can also adjust the tone with different styles so each parameter has more parameters inside. You can also set the size of the eyes, you can slim the face as well as the nose. So it's a lot of parameters for facial beauty. In this same corner we are going to find the color filters that we can preview in real time simultaneously. In the camera settings you can access the capture method settings where you can enable the palm selfie, also smile detection capture or you can touch any area of the screen and it will work as a shutter. So you do have a lot of parameters for comfortable capture of selfies. This front camera seems to me to have a very good quality, especially in the level of detail because it has autofocus. So you can come out very well detailed, the texture looks good, the color also seems to me with a good level of accuracy. The autofocus would allow you to capture the closer details of your face should you require it. But at the same time, if you try to take a picture with good spacing by stretching your arm out as far as possible, you're also going to come out well focused, which isn't always present. In fact, it's a feature that is generally only seen in the high end. This would also allow you to take good group shots, keeping a good focus on almost everyone, except those who are further away will obviously come out slightly out of focus. But that's to be expected. Indoors it also gives us a good result, it is a photograph with a good contrast, also a good noise management, we also have a good color saturation, so overall it is a photograph of a very good level that in this price does come to surprise. In backlit conditions, notice how there are some areas that appear overexposed or completely burned, this before taking the picture. But after taking the picture, it balances perfectly well those areas that were very overexposed and illuminated, although the shadow area seems to me that comes out a little lighter, giving a slightly artificial result. So it gives me the feeling that it is an edited image or something like that. It looks quite strange, the result. Although it could be corrected with an update, it is simply necessary that the shadow area is kept a little darker without getting so much lighter. At night the camera continues to perform excellently, note the good level of detail it has, the excellent handling of noise that practically does not appear even in the darkest areas, it maintains texture as well, so honestly it is a camera performance that even many high-end devices do not have, so it is a totally good camera. Notice how even portraits at night come out very well. Usually at night the portrait can look a bit artificial due to the noise coming out in the foreground and the null noise coming out in the background. But in this case I think it handles the noise very well, keeping the details well, keeping the colors well and applying a pretty nice blur in the background. And in the case of backlit selfies at night, which is a super complicated environment, it also solves it excellently. The highlights area balances it well and doesn't come out completely burnt. The shadows area keeps its essence of shadows but still manages to give a good display. And if you use the screen as a flash simulation, you can get to support a little more the lighting of your face, maintaining an excellent result. The only thing we could reproach to this camera is that for portrait photography does not keep focused on the objects in the foreground, only the faces or body parts. So it could give a little strange results if you are close to an object or have an object in your hand, but really the blur effect is very nice and professional, also the detection looks very good. If it had object detection it would be perfect, although in this price range it is difficult to find a device with these capabilities. In the rear cameras something strange happens because we will find the 13mm camera in theory which would be the ultra wide camera although the photos actually come out 16mm that is they do not come out as wide as they should with a 13mm lens. This ultra wide camera has 13 megapixels with f2.2 aperture and autofocus so either way it has very good specs. 
It will also function as a macro camera, despite not being as wide as it would seem at 13 millimeters. Then we will have the 25 millimeter main camera with 50 megapixels on its sensor. Aperture f1.4 is one of the brightest apertures you'll find in the smartphone market and we also have autofocus and optical stabilization, so it's a camera with excellent specs. And finally, the telephoto camera with 73 theoretical millimeters, but the pictures actually come out at 67 millimeters, meaning it looks like it has a little less optical summation in the end result. The sensor is 10 megapixels and we see aperture f2.0, also with very good brightness, even for good zoom pictures at night, and also has autofocus and also has optical stabilization. So, the approximate sum already talking in the photographic system of the phone is 1x, 0.5x and 3x. And another important thing is that in this area we are also going to find the time of flight sensor for autofocus. So it has a focus that can get to have a lot of precision with the main camera and with the ultra wide camera. Next we are going to do a test trying to capture number 3 and we are going to make several captures to note if it really has a good capture speed or not. On my first two attempts I was seeing real life but on the third attempt I will look through the same cell phone viewfinder to see why there is a slight delay between these captures. Notice, if you are looking at the cell phone screen and trying to capture the exact moment, it takes almost half a second to capture, so it would not be as recommended. And if you're looking at real life and trying to take the capture, it takes more than a quarter of a second anyway, so it doesn't seem to be the ideal device for instant captures. Fortunately, it also has an infinite burst of photos available, although it's not very fast and doesn't start at the exact moment either. Notice how it takes more than half a second before the burst starts and then between one picture and another, there is also a considerable time so in conclusion this device is not so ideal for those who are looking to capture the exact moment on the main interface we have some manual controls like exposure and also focus but if we want more settings we can enter the pro mode where we can regulate the focus more specifically also the white balance the shutter up to 32 seconds also the iso up to 3200 which is not too high and we also have the exposure compensation button in addition, fortunately, a histogram is available and we also have access to raw photography or also combined JPG plus raw. So, professional photographers will indeed find several parameters to have fun with. The user experience is also good scanning QR codes because from the main interface of the camera, they can do this action without the need to enter another application. Although if you try to scan a document, note that it is necessary to enter a special scanner mode and it will automatically try to detect the edges. But note that it is not only a cropped photograph, but it is a fairly advanced scanner that will allow you to rotate the sheets, apply some filters, clean any kind of stain that has appeared, and even add a special marking in some areas that you want. It also allows you to keep adding pages or replaying your recent capture, so I can easily tell you that it is one of the most advanced scanners I have seen on smartphones. So you wouldn't have to download more apps to do this kind of activities that usually have a subscription or additional payment. Also in this case they save in both JPG and PDF automatically. So this may be one of its strongest points. The camera has a high resolution mode that you can take advantage of to try to extract photographs from this image and I think it does manage to maintain a good level of detail. It is not something spectacular but I think it is enough to take advantage of this sensor resolution. For moving pictures, the ultra-wide camera does manage to keep the object static. The main camera also does a good job in this aspect, but the telephoto camera may struggle a bit more to focus specifically if there are moving objects or people, so the result can be a bit bad in these conditions. The ultra-wide camera seems to have good outdoor color capture, I just have to show you that it does generate quite a bit of chromatic aberration, so it's not an ultra-wide camera of a very high standard. But I still think for the price range it's fine, clearly there will be chromatic aberration and a little bit of noise generated in some other areas as well, so it's not a very high level camera but I think for a lot of people it will be more than enough. The main camera has slightly more saturated and intense colors and in this case it does not generate as much chromatic aberration or distortions at the edges of the photograph. So it gives us a good result in this sense. Only the colors seem to me to be a little more saturated than usual. Remember that this device allows you to take pictures with digital zoom do and does not seem to have a crop on the sensor because the level of detail looks a little lower but I think that even with 2x you have a good picture although not as detailed. With 3x the photograph will gain a little more natural colors losing a little of the saturation that the main camera had and I think it does give us photographs with a good level of detail.
Although this lens could generate a bit of chromatic aberration as well, especially in backlit conditions that we will see later. But in good lighting conditions, the results with this zoom camera seem to me to be positive and with respect to the full range, note that we start from the ultra wide camera, which as I told you has a lot of chromatic aberration. We move on to the main camera, which eliminates a lot of the chromatic aberration, although it's still a little bit noticeable. But in this case, I think the colors are more similar between the ultra wide and the main camera. Now we have the two 2x photography which as you can see doesn't maintain optical quality but when we go to 3x obviously we're in front of the dedicated lens so the pictures look pretty good but let's go to the top first we have 10x where it looks with good detail and the maximum is 30x where we are not going to find the maximum quality but i think in the price range it is one of the best devices with respect to the zoom because there are few devices that are going to offer you a telephoto camera so you really have a good quality in the photographic range indoors when there is not as much light present all three cameras perform very well the ultra wide one it should be noted handles noise very well and maintains a good level of detail the main one will be the one that will perform much better here having a much higher detail still but it also maintains good color saturation and more with respect to the telephoto camera it also still has a good photography experience so it really is a photographic system that not only performs well outdoors, but also indoors with a lower amount of light. In fairly extreme backlit conditions, it should be noted that the preview looks well balanced. It doesn't seem to have some burnt areas, although possibly also in this specific scene it struggled to recognize the face. But notice how the result is perfectly well balanced. The brighter areas don't look overexposed or burned out. The shadow area looks with a good level of detail, even though it was a very intensely and aggressively backlit photograph. The ultra-wide camera does not perform as well in this regard, but the experience is still good. Note how the darker areas still have good detail. Maybe it didn't recognize the face very well because of how far away it was in the distance, but it still has a good balance as I tell you, although in this type of photography you can end up revealing a lot more chromatic aberration due to the nature of the lens. And the telephoto camera I think underperformed in this regard because the shadow area you overexposed it too much so it doesn't look very natural, it looks a little pale. In fact in this picture it looks like the focus was mainly on the highlight area. So the result can be strange in these light conditions. At night the ultra wide camera performs well. Again I am surprised how well it handles noise which although present does not spoil the picture and on the other hand keeps the details well. It even has a good balance in the brighter areas that other devices might burn out completely. If you enable the night mode the picture will improve in a subtle way but if you get closer you can get to notice more details. For example, we have a better balance in the highlight area. We have better noise management that is now virtually unnoticeable. So the night mode is useful, although the automatic mode already does a good job. The main camera also performs well with both automatic mode and night mode. And the telephoto camera notes that in automatic mode could give a little more noise than we would like, especially in darker areas, but maintains a good balance of lights in areas with greater intensity of light and good detail. With the night mode there is practically no difference, we still notice quite a lot of noise in these areas. And if there is no light source present in the photograph, note that in this darker result with the ultra wide camera you see a result that is not very pleasant. There is quite a lot of noise, poor color saturation and little detail. And with the night mode the level of detail improves a bit but there is still a lot of noise present in the darker areas. The main camera I think has a better performance in these kind of conditions even from the automatic mode. In night mode there is not too much difference and I find that it manages color very well interpreting the warm light that was present in this scene perfectly well. Even with the zoom lens we're going to have good performance at night something that's very unusual to see on most devices but this one has an f 2.0 aperture so we confirm that it has a very good light input and even using the night mode it slightly raises the detail so the results are quite positive in this aspect with respect to macro photography this is pretty much what you could achieve with the main camera notice that the result is quite good in detail although the focus is not very even due to the nature of the sensor and lens so the edges might come out quite out of focus but the center in focus it could be solved by applying some digital zoom or you can also use the ultra wide camera with macro mode and note that the result is quite good much more even focus and maintains a good level of detail because it's not a simple macro 
macro camera like other two megapixel devices it uses the same ultra wide camera so the result really is very good indeed confirming that it is a camera that performs well in different scenarios note that it is also capable of giving us panoramic pictures with a good quality and a good level of detail in case you need pictures that wide and for portrait photography, I was really surprised by the performance it has. It has good foreground detection, including objects as well, unlike the front camera. Of course, smaller objects might have some shortcomings in its detection, but that's normal for all smartphones. I really find it to be a very good photograph, even for the backlight that was in this environment. In fact, one thing I like is that it lets you take pictures at different focal lengths from 24 to 85 millimeters to 35, which is what you're seeing on screen with a little bit of digital zoom. At the 50 millimeter setting, you go to the dedicated lens where we have a good quality of detail and we still see excellent foreground detection with very natural background blur. And finally, it lets you go all the way up to 85 millimeters in this portrait photography. To give very attractive results, I insist that the smaller or thinner areas of the objects might come out a little out of focus in some areas. But believe me, the level of portrait that this device has is one of the best you're going to find in this price range. For video recording, we will find something positive because it can record in 4K at 30 frames per second with any of the cameras, including the front camera. So we have an excellent quality in that aspect. If you tap on the screen, you can adjust the exposure or the focus again. And in this case, there aren't some color filters or something similar like we saw in the photo. What we will find is a night vision mode for the video that could help you also at night. Although if you activate it, it will change the setting to full HD. When recording video, note that we can seamlessly transition between the three lenses and we also have a convenient slider to adjust the zoom. We will also find a button to pause and resume our recording and a button to take pictures while we are recording but there is no button to rotate to the front camera before we have your video recording. While you are recording, what you will notice is a button to activate the flashlight without cutting your recording. Compatible also in conjunction with the ultra-wide camera, so it has good options for video recording although it does not have a professional mode as we found for photography. The video recording, although it can be in 4K, which I think is very positive, it has some strange cuts when it is moving, which is quite annoying in the final result, so I honestly don't find it an attractive point because of this kind of defects. Obviously I think this could be corrected with an update that I think they should send because it happens with both the main camera and the ultra-wide camera camera. In the telephoto camera it is less noticeable because you record a little less movement but it still happens. Now speaking specifically about colors I think the telephoto camera was the most accurate in this test. The ultra wide camera and the main camera seem to have a little more saturation but overall it's a good thing in these respects. Indoors note how with the ultra wide camera you can get slightly paler colors and less level of detail. Switching to the main camera greatly improves color and detail and even lighting, so the transition between these cameras is immediately noticeable, it is best to shoot with the main camera. And the telephoto camera also has a good level of detail, although it can generate a little more vibrations or noise appears a little more if you move very fast, but that is normal in this price range. In backlit conditions everything will depend on whether or not it can detect your face. In this case it was a pretty extreme backlight, so it focused more on the brighter areas, so you don't notice any aggressive light jumps or anything similar. The main camera, I think it did detect the face and still has a balanced result in terms of highlights, although the shadow area was still a bit darker than expected, but it can still be somewhat acceptable. However, the telephoto camera struggles a lot more. The focus seems to have several problems in this type of conditions, so it is not recommended to record with this camera. By the way, it also integrates an HDR recording mode that can be useful for playback on compatible devices, however it seems that the shadow area has some ghosting that generates a rather strange effect, so even though it has the HDR mode I would not highly recommend recording with it. At night he notes that the ultra-wide camera has a good capture, very clean overall, although if there are much more aggressive movements can reveal a little more noise. Although in the darkest scenes if it struggles and has little light input, notice how immediately when switching to the main camera it has much more illumination and better color, so it is not so advisable to record at night with the ultra-wide camera. 
The main camera will have better light input, better light balance, better level of detail, so everything is better with the main camera, although it can still have moments where the focus can become a little unsettled. But I think the quality is good, although we still notice some cuts when capturing the movements and even some aggressive jumps in the exposure, so I think they can still improve the video recording of this device with an update. The telephoto camera will also record with good quality, especially if there is a lot of light present, but if you go to a little darker areas, the focus may struggle a bit, although fortunately maintains good color saturation. And in darker areas, it still maintains good noise handling, although the focus gets a lot shakier. A funny thing happens with stabilization, because if the device is too hot, even if you enable stabilization, the result will look pretty disastrous, so you have to be careful with that. Always try to make sure your device is cool so that you can record better quality videos. The video you are watching is a test with the device warm, and definitely that is not desired stabilization. Now you're watching a video with the stabilization turned off just so you can get to notice the difference. Here is the ultra wide camera. Later on I switch to the main camera so you can notice how the main camera might get to have a little bit more stability because of the optical stabilization. And the telephoto camera also has a little bit of optical stabilization so on simple movements it could still give you a good result although obviously on more action movements it doesn't. But if you enable stabilization see how the ultra wide camera manages to balance all these movements better. The same will happen with the main camera, with simple movements, or even when running, it manages to balance all these movements in a better way. So as long as it is not hot, yes, you can get to have good results in stabilization, recording video even in the video to the ultra-wide camera, something that few devices offer in this price range. In fact, this device also offers a horizon lock function that is very useful for scenes of much more action, although the resolution drops to full HD. But even if the the cell phone becomes fully rotated, the device maintains a straight perspective. By the way, regarding the maximum zoom range, you should notice that recording with the ultra-wide camera has quite a bit of chromatic aberration, and if it's very hot, again, you're going to notice a bit of a strange jello effect in some areas. It's a very rare thing to see. Subsequently, the main camera has a little less saturated color in this case, and when you move to the telephoto camera, you're going to be gaining more detail. So. The zoom range is good in video recording and it maintains good stabilization. So at the maximum range, which is 30x, you still have a very stable shot with a good level of detail. I think in this price range it's one of the best you're going to find for shooting video by zooming in as long as the device is cool. It doesn't integrate a portrait video recording mode, but in this price range it's not common. And the fast camera is stabilized, which is completely fine. And it lets you adjust its speed from 4x to 32x. By default it records it in full HD. So the speed seems good for recording people, but if you want to record landscapes it can fall very short because as the maximum is 32 X, it cannot get to record the movements of landscapes and the like with a good speed. In this sense it does fall short. And on the other hand, the slow motion can be in 120 frames per second with full HD resolution. Something that is fine, appropriate to the price, but it can even go up to 240 frames per second, although it drops to HD resolution. But again, in the price range, I think it's a slow motion camera that's good enough for various types of content. With respect to focusing, it notes that the main camera can react quickly to the position of nearby objects. I think this is a positive approach in this regard, but with the telephoto camera the focus can react much slower so you have to be patient with it it is not a device that reacts immediately to adjust the focus of this camera although for the price I insist that we should not be so demanding the front camera has good video recording capabilities as well, in 4K at 30 frames per second. The result seems to me very good indeed. It has a good color management, good detail, good stabilization too. Although in backlight it is going to suffer a lot more, especially if it detects the face. If you turn around, notice how there are aggressive jumps in the exposure, so it is not very good in this sense, but in the rest of features it is a very good camera. Especially consider that it has autofocus, so you could bring some objects close to the camera and yes, they are going to focus. Although the color could at times be a little distorted in these types of scenes, but the truth is a camera that I found very good for the price. Indoors it still maintains a good contrast, although there is a greater presence of noise and therefore there could also be a little more jumps in the exposure, especially when it detects or fails to detect the face. So I think you do need to have good lighting for this camera to give a good result.
At night, for example, we are still going to notice this noise that is present. Interestingly, in stills it handled it very well, but in video this situation gets a little more complicated. So even though the video is still of acceptable quality, it's not going to be as remarkable as we had seen in photography, but in the video it is of a good quality. If you go to the darkest possible situations, you will notice that the camera has an option to illuminate your face by illuminating the screen as well, which can be useful because it does not look too noisy as other devices do. The front camera is also going to offer us the fast camera mode with good stabilization, something that is positive and still maintains good color, good detail, unlike other devices that when activating the fast camera the image quality drops a lot. Slow motion is also present on the front so you have good results and again it keeps colors well. That's what I like the most that despite entering different camera modes it maintains the same feeling in quality and color. Obviously it's a simple slow motion at 120 frames per second but serviceable. And again it doesn't have a portrait recording mode but what it does have is a dual recording mode. In fact, interestingly enough, it also has dual photography, and I had forgotten to mention it to you in the photo section because it's not that usual, but it is available on this device. But back to the video, in this case we are talking about a full HD video where you can move the floating frame that has the front camera. So we are also going to have a good tool, although the colors of the camera are pale in this mode. One positive thing is that it does allow you to use the other cameras, although you need to stop the recording and start it again, but there are other devices that only allow you with the ultra-wide camera. However, in this case, you can record with the main camera, with the ultra-wide camera, or with the telephoto camera, and in all, we have the same performance, although I insist you need to stop the recording and start it again before switching cameras. But it's pretty good. In fact, it also allows recording in a split-screen mode, although, again, you need to first stop recording before switching to this mode, but it can be quite useful for some content creators. What you can do is rotate the view between both cameras in this mode, and you can also use, as I say, the ultra-wide camera or telephoto camera in this split-screen mode. I forgot to mention that also in picture-in-picture -picture mode you can rotate the view to load the front camera in the large part and the rear camera in the small part. Motorola incorporates Android 14 in this device and on it the small Motorola customization layer if you can call it that because it is actually a system very similar to pure Android. Some call it MyUX, others call it Hello UX. The truth of the matter is that the name is the least relevant. The truth is that it is a system that has been improving little by little incorporating new functions. Most of them will be collected in the Moto folder and honestly I find it one of the best layers of today because little by little it is gaining a little more identity in the design. The font of the letters is also very characteristic of Motorola giving a very important distinctive even though it maintains a functionality very close to pure Android. They also offer us 3 years of software updates and 4 years of security patches which is not the most advanced but I think it is good enough to keep a device for quite some time with good updates. Now let me tell you about the additional features that this device has. For starters, we will find the customization center where you can modify quite a few things on your home screen. You can also access some themes by changing the system colors. So it's a positive customization. You can also change the shape of the icons so it's enough for you to customize your phone to your liking. But notice how by holding down we can go to the wallpaper section and notice that there is an option to create backgrounds with artificial intelligence so you can take a picture of your outfit so that the device creates a wallpaper that matches your clothing style. So watch, in this case I took a picture of my clothes and it automatically generates these wallpaper suggestions and honestly it's pretty cool, it looks like a good idea to always be combined with your cell phone. It automatically chooses a color that makes a good contrast and you can apply it to both the lock screen and the main screen. The truth is a feature that I had not seen in other phones so it comes in handy. Also to take advantage of the curved screen there is an option called Edge Light that is focused on having your device face down and receive some alerts or notifications through this small curved screen. The lock screen you can also customize it with a good level. Notice how you can even add some widgets and you can also change the clock font so it offers a very good level of customization. In the widgets you can have a lot of additional information and at the bottom you can also choose the style of the notifications. I think this could also be considered a strong point because few manufacturers allow you to modify at this level the lock screen. 
Although curiously there is a very important absence and is always on display that will not be available, we only have the traditional Motorola screen that can show you some information in conjunction and synchronized with the lock screen but will not stay always on but at some point it will turn off again. Which I honestly don't think is a big deal but there are users who consider the always on display feature essential and that's not available here. But there is a new addition that didn't used to be present on Motorola devices and that is the floating windows feature. In fact, there are three buttons in the recent apps list part. One of them is to lock this app so that when you press the clear all button, the locked apps stay running. But there's also another button that allows you to transition from a full screen app to a floating window app and notice that you can resize it, you can even place it in a completely different position and you can also minimize it so that it's like a little bubble. So this has made the transition to being able to open floating window applications much easier. Also note that on this side we can enter a sidebar to be able to open these applications directly and excellent news is that if you can open Instagram for example in this floating format that in many occasions is not allowed to open in this type of format and even YouTube and note that I have one, two, three, four, five apps in this floating mode so it's very good for multitasking because not only does it allow you the apps in a floating window mode but you can also open these apps in a split screen mode to use them at the same time and obviously you can also be combining them to open many more apps. In fact, in this sidebar, you can specifically customize the shortcuts you want to have. And even you can not only add apps, but you can also add direct tools to have other kind of shortcuts or also access to your contacts. The one-handed use mode, unfortunately, only scrolls the screen halfway, so items that are on the other end can still be very tricky to reach. This, I think, could still be improved. You also have the traditional gestures for taking screenshots by tapping with three fingers. Remember also that if you want to take a long screenshot, the button appears on this part to capture more content. You also have a quick launch option to give two taps on the back of the phone and you can select which application you want to enable. By default it is there to play or pause music, but for example you could also use it to take screenshots and the operation as you realize can get to have some delays, you have to tap a little harder for it to react. Obviously we also have the traditional Motorola gestures to open the camera, to turn on the flashlight and many others that Motorola users love. They also have an application called Moto Unplugged that will allow you to concentrate or forget about work or distracting applications. You will be able to select which applications you want to be allowed and whether or not you want interruptions. For example, you can select certain contacts so that they can interrupt you or send you messages, or you can also choose what types of notifications you want to receive if you also want alarms or calendar events, so it can be quite a useful tool to avoid any kind of distraction. Note that you can select the time of the session so during this time you will be completely disconnected from the cell phone. It can be very helpful to de-stress a bit. The device really offers a very good experience at the system level and has a very good optimization in conjunction with its X-axis optical engine so you can get some feedback in your hand when you are using it. For example, in this type of selectors you will notice that at the time of turning you will receive certain bumps in the hand that give a feeling of a completely premium device although there are several Several areas of the system that could improve this. Finally, Motorola offers the Hello You application to connect directly with you, offer support and access to news also from different sources. But as I say, the highlight is that they will offer you access to the deals they are offering, store locations and more support information. This device has an optical fingerprint reader that is inside the screen and honestly the performance is very good. It's very fast, in fact it's one of the fastest readers I've seen recently. It also supports up to five registrations so you can register different fingers or different trusted people. In fact within the customization it will also allow you to change the unlock animation between three different options. And in addition to fingerprint unlocking, it will also offer facial unlocking although it is only in two dimensions so it is not so advanced. For convenience you could use it but you know that for convenience what I recommend more is to access the extended unlock to select trusted devices or places and in those environments your device will not be blocked. This device has the Google password manager which sometimes doesn't work very well although fortunately it does ask to verify first but there are forms that don't fill out correctly so that should be fixed with an update. However, note that it has the MotoSecure app where you have more tools like for example the secure folder where you can use a different password than your lock screen to access and here you can store apps or also files so you have a completely private and secure experience. 
In this part, you will also find network protection that can give you some attack alerts, but it does not have a VPN for a more private browsing. It also offers phishing detection to warn you when someone is trying to trick you on websites. This can be useful for older people. It also has automatic blocking that can help you so that when it detects that you are in an unknown place, it will block again and ask you for a second unblocking factor. It also allows you to change the order of the pins on your lock screen if you use pin to unlock. It also has family space which can also be considered as a kids mode or a second space. You can select your family profiles here and if any member of your family is using it, you can also track the location of this device, define the screen time it can use, manage parental controls. So it can be quite useful and convenient. For example, I can create a profile in this part, I can even customize it with a different name and a different picture. And in the settings, it also allows you to add parental control from another device so you can have better control. So then you simply scan your child's device so you can start managing it from this section. So you can manage the family from this section or you can also access the spaces which as I say have different profiles. So you can create a profile for different children and each profile you authorize access to certain applications. And when you start this session you will also select how long you want this session to last. Your child will not be able to leave this space. He or she will only be able to access the applications that you have previously authorized because to leave you will have to authorize with your fingerprint. In this case it does not have application blocking but I think that with the secure folder you can make up for that and it does not have any antivirus collaboration with any other cybersecurity company. What it does have is ThinkShield for mobile, which is a cybersecurity solution that Lenovo has been developing for a long time and now also integrates it into its smartphones to prevent them from being attacked. And if you happen to lose your cell phone in this case, you are going to be completely dependent on Google as Motorola does not yet have its own implementation of finding your device. And in the digital wellness section, you can also see how much time you are consuming in certain applications and try to set limits. And finally, in the security and emergency section, you can store some useful data or you can also press the power button five times to enable an emergency call. The battery is 4,500 milliampers and there is no doubt that it will not be a strong point of this device. So it's a relatively small battery and the autonomy is also a bit tight. In my test running the battery drainer in the foreground, it reached a time of 3 hours with 50 minutes. And in fact, it is very curious because running the drainer in the background, it had exactly the same time. So it seems that it should improve its management of applications running in the background and with that it could greatly extend the battery life of this device. In fact it is said that with the update to Android 15 could receive such improvements but Motorola has not done anything specific in this regard. Although it notes that there is an option that is disabled by default to try to better manage the applications running in the background, but as I say it is turned off by default so if you turn on this option you can possibly further extend the life of your battery. Also note that it has a battery saver mode that can help you on a day-to-day -day basis, but it does not have an extreme saver mode that could help you in emergencies. The good news is that it has a sorry 25 watt charger is one of the fastest chargers I have seen lately with ease of its strongest point because it will completely crush all of its competition in charging speed. In just 15 minutes I recovered 73% of the energy and the full charge was finished in 23 minutes so even if the battery gets to you to run out a little fast with a little while you put it to charge you will recover a lot. The charger is admittedly a bit bigger than we would like but fortunately it also supports wireless charging at 50 watts which is usually only reserved for high-end devices so in this aspect it can also stand out a lot and it also has the option of reversible wireless charging so you could charge other devices that support wireless charging on the back of this Motorola Edge 50 Pro or you can also charge headphones or a watch that supports wireless charging so it's very good in this aspect as well wireless charging so it is very good in these aspects however for the most part do not put it to charge all night because with this fast charging is not necessary to do such activities but if you want anyway if you have an optimized load that will try to learn your charging patterns to charge much slower at night however also does not have a method of charging lock for those who need to have your device always connected to the current so in that sense the experience is also a little more limited 
This device will support 5G networks, which is very positive, although, as against you, cannot select which applications if they can use your mobile data, and which applications could only connect to the internet using Wi-Fi only has a basic data-saving mode, but I think other devices, if you would allow you to better manage the consumption of your mobile data, fortunately, if it will support card and SIM, although you can only use only one at the same time, but for travel could be useful to be able to add data plans by simply scanning QR codes instead of having to go buy a card without physical, you can only use one of the two at the same time but for travel it could be useful to be able to add data plans simply by scanning QR codes instead of having to go buy a card without physical also supports Wi-Fi and 6 wireless networks so it offers very good download speeds also offers Bluetooth 5.4 for a very good stability with your accessories in fact is the latest in this technology and also offers NFC so you can make mobile payments or connect to accessories. Simply by bringing the back of the cell phone does not have FM radio, but that is something very common in devices of this price. Although it does have OTG, so you can connect accessories through its USB port. In fact, through this port you could also project your screen. Screen. This is something uncommon in devices of this price, usually only found in more expensive devices in addition to the screen projection can be through ready for so you could project in a desktop format for applications to be seen as windows both on your laptop and on a larger screen as a TV. In fact, through this port you could also project its screen. As a TV, in fact, through Ready4, you could also use the webcam on your cell phone as a webcam on your computer, make transfers, have synchronized the clipboard and many other things that are more focused on the ecosystem, but you can install it on laptops or computers that are not necessarily Lenovo. In fact, advanced screen projection can also do it completely wirelessly. So in this sense, if you have very good options that generally other manufacturers do not offer in this price range, also through Ready4, you can connect to many more screens and not only to Chromecast as with the projection of single screen in addition, it also has Android Auto, and it should be noted that its connector is USB 3.1, so it also offers a very good transfer speed and continuing with good features also has a variety of sensors. Among them, we can highlight the presence of geomagnetic field sensor, obviously also has gyroscope and proximity sensor is completely physical, unlike the vast majority of devices today that bet on virtual sensors so that the performance will be completely good having an excellent quality also in sensors. The Motorola ecosystem is currently growing. Fortunately, they have already presented their Motobots that, as I said, also come integrated into the purchase of this device. Specifically, the most recent are the Motobots Plus that already offer us a level of interaction a little more advanced in conjunction with this device, but still we will not find much more interaction. Although they have some other formats of headphones and additional accessories in reality, they do not offer a unique interaction in conjunction with this cell phone that is of the same brand. So the ecosystem I think still has a good range of improvement although coming with Android obviously have an open ecosystem that works well with all Google technologies like quick share or Google fast pay and in conjunction with ready for as I said a moment ago you could also have a good interaction with your computer even if it is not of the same brand but in many things it looks very dependent on Google still like the cloud storage that will be in Google Drive or Google Photos the control of the home devices will be through Google home and in general it comes with many Google applications so it feels like a very close device and dependent on Google in many aspects. Let's move on to talk about the performance. I tell you that this device comes with the Snapdragon 7 Gen 3 processor, a processor that we could consider to be of a recent generation. Sincerely seems to be a good addition, but let's see how it does in these tests. On average, it took two and a half seconds to open each of these applications. Then we have, I think, a good execution, a good time. In fact, I have more than 16 applications open at the moment. And as you realize also, the RAM memory seems to be perfectly well managed. It has 12 applications open at the moment. And as you realize also, the RAM memory seems to to be perfectly well managed it has 12 applications open at the moment perfectly well managed it has 12 gigabytes of physical ram memory and still add 4 gigabytes of virtual ram so it is a device that will handle very well the applications in the background i think it has no problems in this aspect as you can notice yourself in fact motorola by having an operating system that does not have too many modifications generally always has very good stability when having many applications and as you realize this will not be the exception we can have open many applications without any problems and this is a very good device
applications without any problem and this can definitely be considered one of its strongest points because we will have a super smooth running even with many open applications in fact also has artificial intelligence functions to predict your behavior and make applications open even faster although obviously this will be refined as you go using your phone for longer and as you see you can also extend up to 12 gigabytes of virtual ram by default comes with four and as you can see you can also extend up to 12 gigabytes of virtual ram by default comes with four and fortunately if you let you turn off this option in case you consider it unnecessary in fact I would recommend you turn it off the storage is another very strong point because it has 512 gigabytes where you can store all kinds of things this figure even see it in high-end devices but in the most expensive versions of high-end devices so it is very rare to see this figure of storage at this price and is another of the surprising points of this device and next we are going to test the RAM as well as the processor and the storage because everything influences this test. We are going to export a video in 4K recorded with this device. Our three clips joined with a total duration of one minute and ready. It took one minute with three seconds. It seems that it took more time than we expected. Then it is likely that the RAM or storage are not so fast. In fact, the brand does not communicate clearly what kind of technology is used in the RAM and storage as the processor seems that it could give us a better performance performance but in this case we did not get a very fast speed so it is probably more advisable to edit videos only in full HD on this device. Let's talk now about the games and for that we are going to open the application that Motorola incorporates for this purpose. Note that here appear the games you have installed and in the settings of this application you can customize if you want to appear this special toolkit when you are playing. You can also tell if you want or not that appear the text labels under all those icons and you can adjust the type of screen recording in case you want to show your camera. Also if you want it to be in full HD or HD and in fact this is what I like it can record the screen screen at 60 frames per second something that few devices allow so it performs quite well in this aspect you can also tell it whether or not you want the summary functions to appear every time you run a game and also if you want to open applications in floating window while you are playing you could also block calls or notifications to avoid any interruption but you can also allow repeated calls or add exceptions of contacts that if you can get to interrupt you can also block Motorola gestures to prevent interruptions interruptions and you can also access the lock mode that will disable the navigation options so that when you make a slide to avoid leaving the game by accident you can also disable the automatic brightness that is usually lowered when we cover the light sensor when playing so they are very well thought out. These options also bring audio improvements. Then there is no doubt that Motorola has optimized very well its system. And note that at the time of entering a game has this floating button where you can access different performance profiles in case you want to have something more focused on saving battery or if you want to have the maximum performance also shows percentages of CPU and GPU usage as well as the current temperature of the processor. Also we will have here sliders for the brightness and for the volume and also from here you can manage the call or notification blocks and you also have the acoustic lights feature that would allow you to play in silence but anyway despite being in silence through lights on the left or right it could inform you if the sound of some shots for example is coming from one of the sides it also has an option to increase the touch sensitivity and also to reduce the Wi-Fi latency so it has good options and also here you can take screenshots you can start screen recordings as I say you could even be showing your front camera while you are doing this kind of recording so for recording gameplays I think it is a very good tool and also you can have shortcuts to apply applications that you can open in a floating format you can add your favorite applications so while you are playing you can still answer a message or something like that without the need to leave your game in Call of Duty, this device gives us high quality with a very high frame rate by default, although it also allows us to go up to a maximum rate with respect to the graphic compatibility of the FX Note. That apparently it is a processor that has not yet been very optimized because several effects appear unavailable. In fact, it seems that the Snapdragon 778G or the Snapdragon 7 Plus Gene 2 are more optimized with respect to the graphic compatibility and allow us higher quality settings. So if you are the most 
demanding in the gaming, possibly this processor it is still not so optimized to be compatible with various options. Although in the current compatibility, if it gives us a very good experience, for example when we were playing here, if it gave us 60 frames per second on average. Also remember that the screen recording is at 60 frames per second, then gives an excellent experience and in this case even did not even get too hot. Therefore we will say that it is a very good choice to run this content specifically. Also remember that it is a very thin device and that is also remarkable because it does not get too hot. In the Legends game we changed the automatic setting to a manual setting to set up a test according to the price of this device in the high graphic detail at 30 frames per second. And again in this case we had a very good experience, it is not completely free of some frame loss but it is something normal in this game, we have seen it in much more expensive devices and in this case if it managed to maintain an average of 60 frames per second we will have a very good experience and again the temperature stays below 40 degrees celsius giving us a very good feeling when playing even while you are recording the screen so it is a device that brings a very good behavior in this aspect. In the Spongebob game by default the resolution and quality is on high and it is also at 60 frames per second just for testing purposes. We set the resolution and quality to epic to see what this device was capable of. Although we only put this on the most expensive devices on the market and I definitely think the ideal would have been to keep the quality and resolution high to maintain a better experience though honestly it still looks pretty good. Although it has a little more fluctuations than we would have liked but notice how it does not freeze at any time then even in this configuration that as I say we usually use in very expensive devices we will have a good experience so this phone has really left me very good feelings even in games as the temperature barely exceeded 40 degrees celsius and finally in people impact by default gives us the low quality but to put a test according to the price of this device we went up to a high quality we kept several settings on medium but we went up to 60 frames per second and the motion blur we kept it in high quality and the experience I think was positive possibly if we lower a little more the graphics quality we will have more stability because we will have more stability because we will have a good experience. Graphic quality, we will have more stability because it can have some fluctuations but in general it does not freeze at some very specific moment so it can give us a good experience although it must be said that after about two minutes of playing it was limited to 45 frames per second so it was no longer able to reach 60 but the good news is that this administration makes it possible for us to have a good experience is that this management is done in a very intelligent and very correct way because once it reached 45 frames per second it no longer had so many fluctuations. So I think it is a device that also has a very good management to give you a good gaming experience although it is not going to reach very high frames per second at all times I think it has a very good management because it also has a very good management because it also has a very good management because it is not going to give you a good experience in games. If they have a very good management because it also keeps the device with a relatively low temperature considering that there are other devices that have reached 45 degrees celsius in this game even with lower graphics quality so it is remarkable that this device has reached 41.5 in this graphics quality while maintaining this level of stability. In conclusion, it is one of the most balanced and most recommended devices of the moment, although there are still some things that could and should be improved with an update, so hopefully Motorola is aware of this and can improve the video recording to make it go much better and can also improve the performance of the telephoto camera, especially in some backlight conditions, but honestly these are very specific things, but the rest of the features have seemed very good for the vast majority of people. This device will be an excellent choice for the moment. We have reached the end of this video. I hope you liked it if you did you know you can tell us and we'll see you next time